Two, one. Live, it's America's longest running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at ComputerAmerica.com. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. It is the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. And I am your host, Ben Crossman. Yes, Craig is still out sick, but he, uh, you know, he is ever vigilant as, uh, as to what goes on here on the show. And he is listening closely. And he is listening closely today, specifically because it is our going Linux program. It's uh, it's, it's a fan favorite. It's you know it's honestly one of our more popular segments because I guess you guys really 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 like Linux, and it's I guess it's kind of hard to uh, you know outside of certain little uh, outside of certain circles, it's uh, it's kind of hard to get uh, Linux in the mainstream because Linux underpins everything that we do on the internet and in our daily lives. And, you know, just the more that we can get uh, to shine a spotlight onto Linux, the better Linux will be. And, of course, the better all of you will be for it. So, before we get into the guests, I want to uh, do a couple announcements here. First one is, of course, check out ComputerAmerica.com because there we will have show notes for today's show and show notes for every other show and archives of today's show where you will be able to see everything from... Uh, you know, uh, links that we talk about and topics and, uh, of course, links to our guest website. Everything like that will be included in the show notes so you can find it in one place. Don't have to scramble. Don't have to worry about, you know, trying to listen really, really closely. It's all going to be right there, easy to find. And again, you can find that at ComputerAmerica.com. And while you're there, also be sure to check out the social media sites because tomorrow we will be giving away a keyboard from Logitech uh, specifically the keys to go from, uh, from Logitech, which is a $70 value, giving away one of those to a social media uh, kind of follower. So by supporting Computer America, we support you and give you a chance to win that great prize. Now, I don't want to dwell too long on, you know, just kind of like the, uh, the early things, and I just want to jump right into it because, you know, when we were with the two-hour format, we barely were able to get everything in every show. <laughs> And I think with the one-hour format, it's going to be a lot of information really quick, but I think it's going to be fun. So, yes, and you may have heard him a little bit there in the background, but welcome on to the show, Marcel Gagné. He is a longtime Computer America correspondent, and he is the uh, owner and operator of Cooking with Linux, which is, of course, uh, which ran for 10 years in the Linux Journal, and he is now rebooting it as a web series, which you can find on YouTube. And, of course, we will include links to that in the show notes as well. And, you know, uh, a little bit about Marcel. He is a published science fiction author and editor, and, of course, uh, a one-time editor-in-chief, a pilot, a former top 40 disc jockey, and apparently he folds a mean origami T-Rex. So, welcome onto the show, Marcel Gagné. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. How you doing? Doing well. I figured doing if we're going to have to speed things really fast, we'd start sounding like we, if, for, for the people out there who have been listening for a long time, like one of those modems, you know, Right, 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 right. The uh, the the dial-up signal. Not talk fast. Talk fast. Talk really fast. No, no, I'm no. I'm doing no, no. good. How you doing? I'm doing well. Yes, yes. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming out. Yeah, sorry about uh, last month, and you know we, we got the appropriate level of of uh, of hate mail. It's like, hey, where's my going Linux? <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know that had to be what it be. But no, uh, welcome back on the show. And yeah, we missed you. And so Linux, what's up with that? <laughs> What's up with that? Well, it's everywhere. It's everything. We've won. We've won. Linux rules the world. Um, I, that's, I, so I guess we're done for today. What I, else do we want to talk about? I guess, um, I mean, you know, of course, the year of the Linux was always a thing. Um, yeah, it used to be. That was, that was, that's a long running joke, the year of the Linux desktop. You know, I, like, I mean, well, that just probably ran dry, right? Well, it, I mean, it's, you know, I, I swear there are probably still people out there who, who are, you know, running that joke every year. And let's face it, there are a lot of us who still continue to run Linux desktops. I run a Linux desktop. I, I, I can't imagine. In fact, anytime I try to go do something else, um, I 
I, 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 you know, it's, it's just awful. It's just extremely difficult for me to figure out how it is that people actually work from day to day without running something like a Linux desktop. Um, but I also understand that, you know, not everybody needs everything that a desktop has to offer, which is why a lot of people now, uh, an increasing number of people use mobile devices. I mean, they, that is, you know, how they communicate with the world, how they work with the world on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's a tablet or a phablet or something like that. Um, I've, I've got a, a brand spanking new uh, Nexus 6P, which I picked up, uh, you know, not so long ago. And um, it's, it's, you know, one of those devices that, uh, is kind of the interface between, uh, I'm, actually interface is the wrong word here, but it kind of uh, spans, you know, multiple types of devices. It's almost right. big enough to be a tablet. It's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a big phone with a, with a big screen. And of course, it's got the latest technology. It's very fast. Um, it basically, you know, gives you everything that you'd expect to have. And of course, it runs the Android operating system, which, you know, at its heart is basically Linux. So, um, but while that will satisfy most people, desktops, I don't think, are really going away anytime soon. So no. for the power users that you know, need to be able to sit down and, and type something out, I, like I can't tell you the number of times I've gone out and it's like, oh, you know, I just want to, I just want to do a quick Twitter update, you know, because for something, it's always something silly, of course, but you know, yeah. almost always something silly. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's like, but I could type it so much faster if I just sat down at the keyboard. No, uh, we we have another correspondent. He, uh, you know, he, he's uh, wow. I'm totally uh, 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 Mike Cermak. There we go. He's been with us for years and years. He like he went out and he got a Nexus 6P or uh, uh, yeah yeah 6P, and he loves the thing. Like he loves it. Loves. Oh, it. I love it too. But then uh, of course Google came out with their uh, you know with their Pixel phone and said that Nexuses were you know going out the window or at least you know being being discontinued. <laughs> and he's like, wow, I really like that. You know, I really like that line of phone, but, uh, you know, away they go. You know, if you look at the specs, though, between the Pixel XL and the 6P, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of difference. I mean, it's, it, you, you have to really, you have to really stretch your mind around the idea that there's, that there's, you know, it's vastly different. Yeah, it's a little, you know, it's, I mean, we're almost in the Apple land, you know, it's a little bit thinner, <laughs> you know, that sort of stuff. But, um, but the fact is, almost every piece of software that has been, um, you know, that's been hyped for the 6P has already been ported. Sorry, sorry, for, not for the 6P, for the Pixel XL has been ported to the XP by, you know, like the fine folk at FDA developers, for instance. Right. So, so, you know, um, trying to say that, you know, this bleeding edge piece of hardware, which, you know, it practically is the 6P here, is somehow, you know, it's passe now that the Pixel XL is going to be out, you know, in store soon. It's, yeah, I think it's a bit of a stretch, you know. So I, I think Mark, uh, I think Mark, is it Mark? Uh, no, 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 uh, Mike, 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 Mike. Mike. I think Mike, I think Mike can feel comfortable hanging on to a 6P for a year or two. You're telling me that marketing wants you to believe that the thing that's coming out two weeks after another thing is better? Did, did, did I say that? Did I even, did I even hint at anything like that? I think you did. And, but no, uh, Linux can or Linux. Wow, well, Google came out with a lot of uh, with a lot of different stuff, but you know that's a conversation for another time. Um, but no, it's uh, like you said, Linux. You know, runs on many many phones, many many servers. Like everything and anything touches Linux at some point. So obviously, we love dedicating a show every month to the subject. Well, and, and now, of course, even for the people out there who are running Windows 10, if you're running Windows 10, you've got a Linux subsystem that's running on it. In fact, uh, you mentioned at the opening that uh, I have decided to reboot Cooking with Linux as a web show. Uh, right. For the people out there who want to check that one out, it, just go to youtube.com slash freethinkerlarge or slash user slash freethinkerlarge. That's my handle. Or, or, you know, look for Marcel Gagne on YouTube. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that these links will be available. In the yeah, yeah, just, you know, so, you, know, uh, you know, one of the, the first one that I did, though, the first one that I did on a reboot, I started out actually on a Windows 10 desktop. So I started with a Windows 10 desktop and I installed Linux subsystem for Windows um, or the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, I, I think it's WSL, actually. Right. And uh, it's kind of amazing just how far we've come. Uh, you know, Microsoft was, you know, was, was, was the great Satan of open source, you know, so many years ago. And now, you know, you, you go to the Microsoft site, you've got Microsoft Hearts Linux, you know, Microsoft loves Linux. And, uh, you know, they've got Ubuntu in, uh, you know, as the subsystem underneath uh, Windows 10. And I 
took it to the extreme. On that first video, I took it to the extreme. I loaded up all the graphical software and I pushed it to see just how far I could push, you know, running Linux applications. I mean, initially the idea is so that you can run, you know, command line stuff. In other words, you, you can, uh, you know, administer the command line, run programs. It wasn't so much uh, running a graphical environment, but I decided just for fun to see if I could push it to that extreme. And that's what, and, and I, I, I did it. I mean, there are some limitations. There are some things that are not 100% there, but you can effectively run Linux or Linux applications on your Windows now. That's, that's just kind of bizarre. And it's yeah, not just, ridiculous. it's not like being interpreted. I mean, it's actually Linux running in Windows. So, um, so the Linux desktop may not have, may not have happened as uh, specifically just Linux desktop, but in some strange, bizarre, twisted way, the Windows desktop of 2016 is kind of the Linux desktop as well. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but I mean, you know, that is kind of one of the strong suits of, of course, open source is that, you know, hey, anyone can add to it, anyone can take from it, anyone can do, you know, kind of what, what you will with it. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit of affirmation that you get there where Linux is powerful, useful, and diverse enough that possibly someone even, you know, uh, such as Microsoft, takes it for their own and says, hey, you know, this is, this is better than what we have, so we're going to adapt it for our own purposes. That's, that's affirmation right there. Well, it's affirmation, but it's also the glue that holds the internet together, as you alluded at the beginning of the show. So it sort of makes sense that you would take, you know, that that's what you would start to build on. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the last show that I was on, I was getting ready to go to LinuxCon, the 25th anniversary LinuxCon right. that was going to be taking place at the end of August in, um, in downtown Toronto. And uh, it was kind of apropos because... Um, because, uh, you know, not, it was my 25th wedding anniversary as well, which was kind of interesting, but it was, it was the 25th anniversary of Linux on August 25th, 1991. Although now, you know, Lena says, well, you know, I actually made my first version a little bit before that, but that's when the famous email that, you know, everybody quotes went out, uh, was that August 25th. So met a lot of people, uh, you know, talked to a lot of people on the floor, what they were working on, what they were doing, chatted with some people I haven't seen for a long time. But what was interesting about the show? Mm -hmm. is that it was billed as LinuxCon slash ContainerCon. Hmm. And, and it, sort of, it sort of gives you an idea as to where you know, the, the future of systems in some ways is. By the way, I'll, I'll link to uh, some of the pictures that I took on the show so that you can go and take a look at it. Um, I, I, even, I, even, I even managed a selfie with, you know, with the man himself, Linus Torvald. Very nice. <laughs> So there it is. It's, it's, it's in that collection of photos. But you'll, you'll see some of the things that's happening there. But it was billed as LinuxCon slash ContainerCon because that's the new hot thing, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, in the open source world. Um, there are like lots of different container type companies uh, who were all out there at the show. And in some way, it was really, really interesting. It was really telling of where things are going because at one time you go to one of these shows that was all applications. You know, it's like, here are the latest apps. You know, here's our latest version of this desktop, that sort of thing. Right. And while there was some of that, including a big booth by Microsoft, by the way, <laughs> so there's this big Microsoft booth up there um, showing off their, you know, their Windows subsystem for Linux. I got a, a neat demo of it, which I recreated in that first video, by the way. Um, but they talked about, they talked a lot about uh, this new thing, containers. Now, on the show, I've mentioned virtual machines more than once. Yeah. And I, I do that because you know, often I'll have a distribution focus. So we'll talk about a particular distribution. Here's a cool distribution you want. You might want to take a look at. Here's the reason you might want to take a look at this particular distribution. Um, the thing with running a virtual machine is uh, it's really neat because I can boot up a virtual machine off a, you know, um, an image, a Linux desktop image, whether it's, you know, the latest Fedora, the latest Ubuntu, whatever it happens to be. And I can run it on my desktop without having to scrap my entire system. So I don't have to blow away my whole system. And I don't have to even get out 
of the system that I'm currently working on. So if I'm actually busy working, but I want to try out something different, I can have it running on the PC that I'm working on. And um, if, I, if, if, if go ahead, else, sorry. Yeah, no, if nothing else, that just shows that maybe Linux users have a propensity to be easily distracted where <laughs> instead you're working, it's like, I wonder what this entire different operating system will be like. And then you kind of virtually do it real quick. And, uh, but no, it, it obviously has very, very, uh, you know, obvious applications and, you know, virtual machines, like you said, you know, instead of having to wipe everything and start over from square one, why not create a, a little virtual one? So makes sense that, uh, you know, that that's a very, very important feature of Linux. And I'm sure a little, in just a second, we're going to get into the difference between a virtual machine and a container itself. And, you, and yes, we will. But OK, so just to just to right. stick on the virtual machine for a moment. The nice thing about it is almost any, first of all, modern Linux distribution uh, married with a modern piece of hardware. And by modern, I mean pretty much anything in the last five years. So, I mean, it's, it's not like it has to be bleeding edge here, is going to have... Um, is going to have something like KVM built into it. It's going to have support for KVM. And KVM allows you to fire up a virtual machine. Um, it, it's a you know, kernel-level virtual machine. And, um, and because everything is already there, you don't actually have to install anything separate. In the past, I would have installed VirtualBox, but even that's not really necessary anymore if you're running, you know, if you're running KVM on you know, a more modern piece of hardware. VirtualBox was great if you couldn't run, run uh, kernel-level virtual machines. Uh, as in uh, virtualization was impossible at the CPU level, but anything recent is going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about virtual machines is you're actually running an entire machine. And while that's pretty cool, um, it does have some downsides. Now, I want to point out that virtual machines are still a big thing on the internet. If you go to uh, any of the big hosting providers, you find VPSs all over the place, virtual private servers. Right? right, where you fire up a complete, uh, sometimes they'll run on Zen, sometimes they'll run on KVM. I mean, it depends on, on the, particular, uh, the particular company, whether it's, uh, I don't know, DigitalOcean or Linode or, uh, or Amazon Web Services. Um, there are a lot of companies that provide virtual machines on the internet. And of course, um, corporate data centers that have like big pieces of hardware have been using VMware, you know, to do virtualization for years as well. It's like, I've got lots of hardware, but I need to run a server to do this, a server to do this, a server to do that. Uh, but I'm going to do it all inside this, you know, this virtualized infrastructure on, you know, one, you know, one machine as opposed to having three or four separate machines to do the same job. Now, obviously, you need the horsepower to be able to do that. And therein lies one of the issues with virtual machines. Mm -hmm. You're recreating the entire machine. Okay, so it's like you're yeah, running a the, bare the, bones the way server that, with everything. Right. The, the way that you said that, it was like, it's like you're building the whole machine. And I guess, you know, why, like the, the way that you put emphasis on it, it doesn't hit you until, you know, you say it like that, that it's like, is that overkill? That might not be over. Like, why is that overkill? You know, we've been making virtual machines for the past 15, 20 years. Like, why? Yes, uh, we have. Why is that a problem all of a sudden? And uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's funny that it's even it's funny that you would even consider it a problem. And the reason I'll say that is, um, we have such powerful hardware exactly. now. We have there there are more. I mean, the reason that Amazon and Google and you know. Uh, What's their names? Uh, the other guys, um, anyway, are in the are in the uh, business of selling resources, of selling cloud storage, of selling uh, you know software as a service, hardware as a service, you know virtualized hardware as a service. The reason that all this stuff exists is because there is, a, you know, there's far more computing power and and resources, disk space, storage, memory, computational power, and so forth, than than there are people to use it. So so you can just sell the stuff, and you sell it cheap. In fact, nowadays, I mean, um, getting a virtual private server can be as, you know, like five bucks a month if you want, you know, uh, with some of these companies. So this stuff has come down an amazing amount. But of course, then you have to not only um, load up a complete machine, but you have to maintain a complete machine. So you have to maintain all the patches, all the security stuff that goes along with it. You have to log into all those machines. You have to, you have to check logs on all those machines. So even though you've only got like one piece of hardware, you now have, you know, maybe 10 machines that you have to administer, right? Right. That you, have, that you have to check out each and every month. So it's not like it reduces the workload in any way. It reduces 
the infrastructure by quite a bit, okay, or potentially quite a bit, because now I don't need to have, you know, 10 servers. I can just have one which runs 10 servers on board. But that doesn't mean that I don't have to administer each and every one of those 10 servers. Okay. Right. So at the, so, so the big thing now is at some, and this actually started a long time ago. So this isn't like, this is something new, but it hasn't, it's really only come onto its own very recently. And the idea is that you've got, uh, is that you share the operating system. Okay. So at the base level, you've got your Unix operating system. You've got the server, you've got the host operating system that runs on top of it. You've got some kind of an engine which is going to administer these containers. Probably the most popular one, and somebody's going to beat me up out there, I'm sure of it, for, is, is Docker. Okay? Um, Docker is, is, is the most popular one. It's going to be the most popular one, and, um, and it's the one that's probably available on, if, if you're loading up uh, Red Hat or Fedora or Ubuntu or whatever, Docker's there. Okay, I'm obviously a modern version of it, I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. um, and what it does is you've got, it's, it's like, there's, a, there's the explanation I see. It's like you know you've got a ship, and you've got all these containers. You just stack all the all the things that you're going to ship somewhere in a container. Well, containers allow you to take an application that has specific libraries, that has specific executable files, specific configurations, and so forth. Package it up literally into a container that you can then put on any Linux server out there. Okay. It passes through the Docker, uh, the Docker engine, mm -hmm. and you can run that specific or that, that specialized environment that would or normally require a separate server to run it, um, but without any of that additional overhead through the existing host operating system and server. So the overhead is much, much lower because you don't need to run a separate operating system. You don't need to virtualize all the hardware. You don't need to virtualize uh, networking, uh, disks, all that sort of stuff. All that goes away because you're actually using the server. And your specific environment to do whatever it is, whether it's, uh, whether it's web services, whether it's uh, something like, a, I don't know, an email server like Zimber or something like that, you could conceivably run tiny processes or, or huge massive you know, uh, service-oriented platforms inside their own container. And the beauty about that is somebody can pre-configure these things. Hmm. Okay? They can pre-configure it with everything that's needed to operate and run this thing and then make it available for you to download and then run it through a Docker container. That sounds suspiciously like a distribution. It sounds like that, except for the fact that you are leaving out all the things that aren't necessary. You see, a distribution can contain thousands of programs, packages, libraries, additional files, none of which you may actually need. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, and of course, every time that you, every time that you update this thing, that you change it, you're potentially modifying this other environment as well, which you may or may not want to do depending on what it is. Okay. Or maybe you want to modify that environment, but you don't want to modify the operating system for whatever reason. Uh, you want this to be able to continue living in harmony with other that may not need the same thing that this other thing needs. So the containers allows, um, you know, you, let's, let's call them application A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, just for fun. So you've got like six or, you know, or application one, two, three, four, five, six, um, which who all need their own specific libraries, their own specific, uh, you know, uh, subsystems and programs. But Docker allows them all to work individually in their own little environment, regard, you know, without affecting the distribution that's sitting underneath. Hmm. So it's, it's really kind of cool. Again, it's, this, is, this idea has been around for a long time and it's been sort of hit and miss for a long time, but it's finally coming into its own. And judging by the number of companies that were sitting at uh, LinuxCon slash ContainerCon, um, companies are pouring vast amounts of money into this. They see this as the future. And, um, and it's pretty exciting. I've, um, I actually started experimenting with it. Uh, just yeah, like three or four I, days ago on my own desktop. And, um, right. it, and it, I'm getting excited. <laughs> the, uh, the, and of course, the question is, I, I mean, I, I'm looking at the Docker website and, you know, I'm trying to poke around. Obviously, uh, they have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of information and a lot of literature here dedicated to the enterprise level and the enterprise, uh, the enterprise application of things like containers. 
Um, but, you know, I, I guess for our, for, for our audience and, you know, although admittedly, you know, there, I've talked to more, uh, you know, Linux system administrators here, you know, from the show than anywhere else. But at the same time, what kind of applications or, you know, is this something that, let's say, the average person is going to be using when they don't even know? Or is this going to be something that you actively kind of make? Like, does this have applications on, like, a personal level and not just an enterprise level? Well, you know, it, that's, that's, that's a tough question. But, yeah, I think, I think there will be applications on a personal level. Um, it, because, because putting together an application relies on so many other things inside the operating system, you would have to, you know, spin up a package for Fedora release such and such, and a package for Ubuntu release such and such, and a package for Red Hat release such and such. So you would you would put together packages for all these different distributions, okay, and that. That actually adds, obviously, a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of development uh, costs to anybody who's trying to put together a specific software package. Now, I'm not saying that this is, you know, the I'm not saying this is the be all and end all, although it may wind up that way at some point. <laughs> but pretend for a second that uh, I'm releasing, I don't know, uh, just a game. Let's let's call it a game just for fun. Uh, sure. Some some great, you know, first person shooter, whatever it happens to be. And um but I need to make a version that works on this version of, of Ubuntu and I need to make a version that's gonna work on the next version of Ubuntu. And I need to maintain a version that works on Fedora. That's a lot of work. So what happens sometimes is they would put together what they called static um like static binaries where everything was rolled into the binary. Um, that was fine, um, but of course you may need to have access to you know other things that run. There may need to be other systems that run in the background, other you know other libraries, other programs, and that makes bundling it into just a um, uh, a static binary a little bit more a little bit more difficult because you still need a lot of external stuff. What the container does is it lets you package all the things that are necessary for that application to run, and you just run that container. Okay, so you run an you run an instance of that one container, and everything comes with it. Hmm. And it doesn't matter whether I'm running Ubuntu. It doesn't matter whether I'm running Fedora or whatever. In theory, I just you know download the container, and and run it, and it will work. It will just work out of the box. I'll give you an example. Sure. And uh, you 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 can you can if 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 you think we're running close to to a, a break here or something like that, let me know because got, I might go on. Minutes. You got a few minutes. Okay, cool. One of the things that was uh, that uh, happened a couple of days ago. This is like uh, three or four days ago. KDE, my my favorite desktop environment, as you know, mm-hmm. um, had its twentieth anniversary. It was the twentieth anniversary of the release of KDE one. Okay, now, like this is a long time ago. This is twenty years ago. Okay, a lot has changed, as you know, on desktops oh, in twenty years. <laughs> things look a lot slicker and a lot shinier, but some some nut, uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's Jonathan Rydell, uh, <laughs> had had this weird idea that it would be fun to be able to run KDE one like the original. Um, is, is, is it him? Hang on, I'm trying to remember who it is that did this. I'm gonna, if I apologize to the person who put it together initially, but I saw it on Jonathan's site at one point. Anyway, they put together trying to run something from 20 years ago is hard. Okay, because you've got that the libraries don't exist anymore. And if you try to compile them, they're not necessarily going to compile them with modern compilers. So all this magic and this mojo and this weird stuff that needs to happen for you to be able to do that. And it's, you know, it's potentially a bit of a mess. Well, lo and behold, um, he put together this container of KDE1, which had the entire old desktop environment, including the libraries from 20 years ago. <laughs> and and the graphical toolkit that was necessary. Cause remember, the graphical toolkit doesn't exist anymore. It's you know it's from years ago as well. Into a container, and using that container, I was able to fire up a um, uh, a separate graphical window. And I, I'd, I'd like to mention that one because that's kind of fun as well. I'd I'd forgotten about this until recently, um, but I was able to run inside the separate graphical window this twenty year old desktop. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, so I like this is what it looked like 20 years ago. I was like, oh, this is so cool. I, I, I mean, like, I've never heard applications where, uh, you know, like maybe for historical purposes or, you know, maybe uh, someone may be running just like, 
I've worked in like the manufacturing field. Sometimes some programs still run on Windows XP or 95. Like I've seen it. I've seen it in the wild. So uh, it seems like, you know, fun nostalgia trip for some, but uh, this could have applications in a lot of different ways. But hey, uh, Marcel, music yep. you have to take a break. Everyone else, stay tuned for more uh, going Linux here on Computer America as we, you know, do our thing. So stay tuned. <laughs> Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. The mission of Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is to help build a sustainable, no-kill community where no dogs or cats are ever killed for population control. Where true euthanasia is reserved only for animals who are irremediably suffering or for animals who are truly a threat to society and with no hope of rehabilitation. Brother Wolf staff and volunteers go door-to-door, neighborhood-by-neighborhood to educate citizens about local resources available for at-risk pets and to help their families connect with those resources. Brother Wolf's community-based approach to no kill helps keep family pets healthy happy and in their homes and out of the local shelter system in the first place for more information or to make a tax deductible donation to this wonderful 501c3 organization visit their website at www.bwar.org help to realize brother wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home who's a good boy Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? (laughs) That's so great, huh? It's the fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. No, you don't place bets with a Facebookie. Marty Winston with a new Stips Bulletin review for Computer America. This time, the new tone model LA600WH MP3 customizable door chime mechanism. Yeah, it is a doorbell that hangs on a wall looks like a door chime housing works with wired or wireless front and rear doorbell buttons but the new tone mp3 doorbell offers some wonderful flexibility it comes with eight mp3 files that sound like authentic chimes including their vibrato and decay you choose one for the front door and one for the back door or you make a usb connection to substitute your own mp3 file pipe songs rock songs up to you. Bottom line, a new tone MP3 customizable door chime lets you change the sound of either door to a buzz, a ding, or a chime, and more. Marty Winston, News Tips Bulletin for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 30 minutes past the hour as we continue on here with Mr. Marcel Gagne, and we are doing Everything Linux is our all Linux show as we have the host and, of course, the rebooter of the Cooking with Linux uh, web series. And, you know, we're going to talk in a little bit more about uh, C- Cooking with Linux, what you're planning on doing with it, and just what it's developing into because it seems like it's becoming, you know, more and more than just a little passion project. It's, uh, you know, starting to become its own thing. So, yeah, we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit as well as we are going, uh, but right now we are talking about uh, these things called containers and, you know, just what you can do with them and how they could be used in the future and not just kind of web applications and not just applications on a desktop, but I mean, like the way that you're kind of hyping it up and the way that you've kind of, you know, uh, described what a container was, this seems like instead of running a, you know, this complete package of, you know, all the background stuff that you need for a program. Instead, it's kind of this, you know, all self-contained program that you'd kind of download the container and then you don't have to worry about what they're running it on. As long as they can run the container, they can run whatever's in the container. 
That's right. So you, so you can distribute uh, the entire application that way and everything that's necessary to make the application work. No, and I, I mean, you, you mentioned that this isn't the end all be all, but it could be one day. I mean, is, is this kind of like the next extension of just an operating system where maybe an operating system is simply something that, you know, like you boot into, but then you have, uh, you know, of course, Docker would really like to be the one and only solution for this. But I'm sure, you know, whatever application you're running to or you are using to run a container, like, I mean, you can see a very clear advantage to if, you know, if you could just release one product and everyone could run your one product without having to, re, you know, recompile it or, you know, redo everything for every single distribution, it would make a lot of sense if everyone just started using containers. Well, it would, I mean, yes, I mean, it would make sense. I'm not sure that that's going to be the be all and end all. I'm not right. sure it's going to be the only thing because, you know, there's, there's still a lot of simplicity about, hey, this is, uh, this is the server that I'm running. This is the, uh, the, you know, what I'm running on my desktop at the moment or, you know, or my server in the background. So it's not necessarily that, but, but being able to distribute applications that way certainly makes development a heck of a lot easier. And it can certainly make, you know, administration a heck of a lot easier because you only need to worry about what's in that package. Now, there are potentially downsides as well. And one of the downsides is you can be talking about uh, the, the container itself can be huge, <laughs> like <laughs> can be monstrous because you want to have this thing be able to run, but sometimes to be able to run the application requires practically all of a distribution hmm. to be able to make it happen. So like, or, or a huge chunk of a distribution to be able to happen. So you can have, you know, monstrous things, but um, as, as we come up with, you know, a better compression, as we come up with better ways to, to, uh, to deal with that sort of thing, um, I, I, think, I think some of that's going away. But, but it is, it's, it's neat. And again, I mean, I've, I just started playing with it, and I'll, I'll, I'll just give you an idea. I was talking about, I, I, I sent you, um, I know that people aren't going to be able to see it at the moment, but I actually just sent you a picture on Hangouts there that shows my, this, this old KDE1 desktop running inside a, inside a container shell. Uh, inside a Docker shell. Yeah. So it's it's just it's you know th this is kind of a, a bizarre sort of application of really modern technology, but it's a uh, it's a neat thing as well. It's a neat thing uh, showing what you can and cannot do with it. Yeah, it, it's and, and of course, um, first of all, I'm shocked because I I never really saw the KDE or you know the KDESOP environment. <laughs> um, you know the first one because back then I was still using Windows 95 because I was four years old, but you know seeing it. Hey, you know, I, I gotta admit, it looks it, it looks pretty modern, um, you know, for a twenty year old operating system. Um, <laughs> but no, very very impressive. And I guess, you know, if if you need everything that you would for a virtual machine, then I guess at some point this thing could just be a virtual machine. Like it doesn't have to be a container. Yeah, well, so. except that you know, and, and except that it, the the uh, the the issue that I mentioned there is is more one of space than anything else. Right. The problem with a virtual machine is you have to administer that virtual machine. Oh, that's true. Okay. So no matter what, I mean, even if, even if it turns out that, you know, we, we, we can't scale these things down to something that's a little bit, you know, that's a, a little bit uh, less massive, let's say. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to make a whole heck of a lot of difference. And in, in, I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to make it any better or, or less worse, if you will, than uh, running in a, um, in a virtual machine, because the virtual machine is always going to require the same amount of administration that a physical machine is going to require. And that, you know, that's, that's difficult. I know I maintain a lot of virtual machines for customers and uh, I have to log into every single one of those darn things. Uh, yes, I've got automated processes that take care of a number of things, but you still have to check on them. You know, so, um, so this, is, this is a neat thing. And, uh, and if you go to, uh, and, and one of the things about, uh, about Docker is if you uh, go to store.docker.com, there are two places you can go. One of them is hub.docker.com where you can get an account and, uh, and set yourself up there. But you can go to uh, uh, the Docker store, store.docker.com. The word store in this case doesn't mean that you're actually buying anything. Um, but you can browse on there and take a look at all sorts of, and I mean like all sorts of things. <clears throat> there are databases, uh, um, databases, uh, messaging uh, systems, uh, applications, uh, uh, like 
it's, it's hard to imagine the things that you can't get there. This morning, one of the things I played with, I thought, you know, this, uh, I, I thought, how far could you push this? And I was thinking about the idea of, you know, when you set up a web server, mm-hmm. um, we use things like, uh, if you're hosting, if you're a company that's doing web hosting, for instance, you use things like cPanel and things like that to, to administer these things. And sometimes that's a problem because, um, you know, some sites don't play well with other sites. Um, they may be more prone to, uh, to being attacked or they may require maintenance at a specific level. I mean, I could... I can think of all sorts of reasons why it could be a problem, but I thought, what would it be like? I mean, could you do that? Could you just uh, deploy, say, a Drupal website? And just for fun, I went out and I went on store on the uh, on the um, Docker store, right. and and they've got the latest Drupal image there. So there's a late eight eight point two point one or something like that of Drupal, and it comes packaged with the Apache web server, <laughs> like everything you need to run this thing. So you 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 name the instance that you're going to run this thing and it's, you know, Docker run, you know, some name Drupal and, uh, you know, and a port, you redirect the port to, you know, 80, 80 to 80 or something like that. And you have access, you can fire up a complete website, complete with its own web server and so forth without having had to install any of those other things. It's all just there. It's, it's kind of the, you know, it's kind of the old dream of click and run, if you will. Remember the old click and run dream? It's like you just, you just download something, you click it, and you're there. You just can use it. That, it, it, no, it, and, and of course... It's the dream. Yeah, no, and, uh, and you know, stupid question, obviously, but let's say you do that, um, you know, then, of course, you put in the proper, uh, you know, web address, and it would just run completely off of that little container. Like, like anyone with a browser could just access that just like that? Absolutely. That Absolutely. And, so and that's precisely what I did. <laughs> Oddly enough, just before the show started, I thought, oh, let's try this. <laughs> and that's what I did. And in the background, I've got a, um, I've got a uh, little virtual window in the background. And again, this is not a virtual machine. This is just a little, you know, a little graphical window that I open in the background um, using uh, something called Zephyr, X-E-P-H-Y-R. <clears throat> Zephyr is kind of neat because it lets you run a, um, a windowing environment on top of your windowing environment. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, I, I hate using the word container here because we're talking about a different thing, but it's kind of like a, you know, a container for its own set of graphical applications so that they don't interfere with your own graphical applications. Right. If you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. If you have a, yeah. Only slightly. No, but it, <laughs> it, it sounds very, very uh, interesting. And of course, um, you know, you mentioned that you just went to the 25 anniversary and the fact that, uh, you know, it was given, I assume it was a nickname that a, you know, container, uh, you know, kind of expo. Uh, we're going to, of course, hear more of it, but hey, you know, it's, uh, it definitely sounds like a, a, a good future for Linux. I mean, just something that, um, you know, very, very simple, low resources. And because of Linux and its current set of applications, you know, in, in the web and things like that, the low resources that Linux can get with these, you know, with these containers the better off I think everyone is going to be. It's going to be faster web pages, faster internet, faster everything. So exactly. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Okay. So, so. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> so, no. The thing I wanted to move on to was, sorry, was, uh, was cooking with Linux because yes. that is starting to look really, really interesting. I, I believe you just said you just finished up episode five. I did. I just uh, finished episode five. Uh, in fact, uh, like I said, you know, if you go to the, uh, if you go to my uh, Google page, um, they are there at the moment. I have, um, what I have at the moment is um, the, the, the format is, uh, I, I haven't hired Francois yet. I've actually had people who sent me emails asking me if, you know, uh, that they missed Francois, my old waiter from the Cooking with Linux column. Well, I can't afford to hire Francois because, you know, I don't make any money off of this, but <laughs> yet, but it's a fun yet. little project, yeah. and uh, each time I'm going to take some aspect of, uh, of what under Linux, and uh, not only hopefully try to make it fun and make it interesting, but uh, make it something that you can you know you can play along with on Linux. Uh, yes, I do recommend a wine, or or I, I'll I'll let you know what I'm drinking or what I'm eating on the on the show. <laughs> so yes, that's a little bit part of it, and um, and. Uh, we do, uh, or I do, a, a number of different things. Like the first one was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, running in Linux under Windows 10. Then I did one where I went through all the steps necessary to actually uh, download and install a virtual machine. Speaking of virtual machines, so that was like uh, that was my episode two. Uh, 
And in episode three, I decided to, uh, to do a distribution focus, sort of, mm. uh, because I call this one the FOSS sacrilege or Linux sacrilege, if you will. And that's because I remember uh, the, the, last sh- the, the last show that we did before we had our little mini hiatus there in September, right? We were talking about, um, somebody put me to the wall. We were talking about Fuchsia, okay, which was this operating system that Google is developing, you know, to replace conceivably Android, although it's, you know, it's, it's kind of magical. I'm not sure that anybody really knows uh, what the uh, end game of this is actually going to be at this moment, or if there's going to be one, because as you know, Google likes to throw things the wall, uh, you know, uh, against the wall to see if it sticks. Yes, it is. And, uh, and uh, which is why you get, you know, cool Google products that disappear after a couple of years. It's like, oh, that was so cool. Like uh, Project Aura, you know, the, uh, the, the modular phone, you know. Um, so there are all sorts of ideas like that that they try, and then sometimes they just, you know, dispose of it, it goes away. But Fuchsia is yet another one of those things, and we'll wait to see where it goes. But Craig, uh, you know, put me against the wall, and he said, are you more, you know, is it more important to you that the project be Linux-based or that it be open? Which I thought was an interesting question, or maybe it's you who asked the question. I can't remember. One of you two put I me against the wall and answered that question. Yeah, yeah that was Craig. Um, and I said it was more important to me that it was open because I believe firmly in open standards and open source. And I even, I even believe in open hardware development, uh, you know, which is, you know, one of the reasons I love the whole, the whole bit with uh, my Nexus phone, because it was a Nexus phone. It's already unlocked. You know, it's, 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 it's a nice philosophy. And uh, so far, Google has been really good at adhering to that. But there are a lot of other open source projects that are out there, which aren't necessarily Linux. And, um, and you know, they do things like, you know, on there, you could do things like, you know, run containers and so forth. I haven't tried this yet. I, I may try this after we, we, uh, we finish up the show here, <laughs> waste some additional time. <laughs> but the third episode, I decided just for fun to load up uh, Ghost BSD, which is an open source alternative to Linux. Hmm. BSD. I, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I, I never thought about alternative to the alternative uh, to an operating yes. system. So interesting. And what's really interesting about that is it boots up with the latest um, KDE Plasma desktop. So, so the environment, although technically speaking, under the surface looks a lot like Linux, if you're familiar with work, if you're familiar with Linux, if you're familiar with Linux and you're used to working in a Linux environment, it just doesn't seem all that alien. You know, you boot up this alternative open source distribution. In this case, you know, FreeBSD, and this one, this one was GhostBSD, the one that I did in the um, in episode three of Cooking with Linux, and it looks for all the world like a Linux desktop, like a, a, you know, because it's running a Plasma KDE desktop. I, and, so it's. Like he, here's here's where I kind of run into it um, uh-huh. with, with this. It's like it's great when people want to you know kind of start a, an operating system from the ground up. Like like that you know that's your prerogative. That's what you want to do. Perfect. Do it. Um, it's just that I think when you go alternative to alternative to alternative and like you and like as you run down the ladder of not even like willingness or passion or anything like but that, more support. I mean. Uh, financial time to work on it, uh, the amount of uh, contributors who actually, uh, you know, submit code for it. Uh, you know, Windows 10 is a monster, is a behemoth of lines of code. You know, there's millions upon millions upon millions. And for someone to have, you know, uh, a consortium of four guys who are trying to make an alternative to Linux entirely, I mean, you know, I, I, when you said that it, underneath the hood, it kind of looks like Linux, you know, goes BSD. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of, you know, borrowed from it because you just don't have the people to sit well, down and write. Well, I, I, I would, I, I'm going to, I'm going to stop you there because um, I, I have, I have friends who are, who are massive BSD fans who uh, for years have been trying to convince me that, you know, I've, I've been, uh, I've been writing the wrong boat. Uh, <laughs> I, I disagree with them. <laughs> To this day, I disagree with them. You know who you are. If you're out there, you know who you are. Um, but uh, BSD is not something that just appeared today, and it's not something that was created from Linux. BSD is back from the days of Unix. Uh, Berkeley Systems is what the BS in, in, in BSD is. And uh, the Berkeley Systems Unix system uh, was a free Unix implementation uh, that 
you know, and I'm trying to decide, I'm, I'm trying to decide, uh, I, I don't have its timeline sitting in my brain at the moment, but it has been around for a long time. And there is a, there is a huge community uh, of people, both uh, professional and, uh, you know, and amateur that work in the BSD community, whether it's free BSD or ghost BSD or open BSD, because as with Linux distributions, there are a lot of different versions of BSD out there. Uh, BSD had the reputation in the early days of being an amazingly stable and secure environment on which to run a server. And by a server, I mean you know, like an email server or a web server or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it had, it had a stellar reputation for that sort of thing in the early days. Uh, not, not just for security, which you know, Linux had as well, but for stability. You know, it was boring, but it was stable. And then somewhere along the way, uh, people decided to start porting the graphical desktop tools to BSD so that the borrowing comes more from the graphical desktop environments than it does from borrowing from Linux specifically, because I think the, I, I, they're, they're both inspired by the Unix operating system, okay. you know, from way back when, uh, but they have both been developing a, along their own, you know, their own trajectory ever since then. So, so the borrowing is more a borrowing of applications than it is of the operating system per se, well, if that it, makes sense. No, it, it, it just to me, it was, you know, the, the well, and maybe because I'm just, you know, not very well versed in this, but the idea of creating an entire operating system, uh, you know, great that it started so many years ago, but just the idea of, you know, trying to make something new. It would take a lot of resources. You know, it would, well, it, it, it does, it does. But you know, but it takes a lot of resources to make a new model of a car. Right. You know, it takes. A, it, I mean, so why do we have? You know, why do we have GM and Ford and Honda and and uh, you know and BMW and, and and Volkswagen and and you know every other one out there? Why do we have all these? Why can't we just have one company making a car? You know, well, um, I'm, I'm definitely not recommending the the one manufacturer <laughs> kind of timeline, but. <laughs> As long as Ghost BSD and you know, and, and, or BSD in general, uh, you know, is, is as fully featured as anything else, then you know, great for alternatives. Yay! I was just worried that you know maybe BSD because personally I'd never heard of it. I, I was worried that it was you know less. The other alternatives out there. Uh, you know, it 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 may certainly be, and it, I, you know, and and again, I'm gonna get beat up I, I feel like i feel like i'm, I'm walking on, on you know on coals here on this show today because somebody's going to beat me up for this but but i i'm not sure that it's as i'm not sure that there's a, an issue when it comes to a server-based environment uh i don't think it's and i'm not even sure that there's a problem in terms of features per se in terms of application support here we go with the problem that linux had compared to windows all those years ago then I think we've got an issue. I think at that point we just, we certainly have a problem. But it, there's there's more to it than just hobbyists. I mean, there are people who this is the tool that works best for them. And uh, in the case of distributions, yeah, there's 150. Uh, Charles de Gaulle is famously, I think it's Charles de Gaulle is famously quoted as saying, you know, how can you run a country that has 250 different types of cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he was talking about France, uh, or you know, or 400 types of mustard. Like, I mean, how, how do you run a country like that? Um, but you know, and how do you run a an operating system environment or a, or an operating system ecosystem? Uh, ecosystem that has, you know, 150, 200 different distributions, like, is it, does, does that become nuts at some point? Yeah, maybe it does. But sometimes it's like, you know, I need a specific set of tools that I know is going to be maintained in a specific fashion. And I like to work in a particular environment, which is why we created this particular version of the operating system. And in the end, that is one of the beautiful things, one of the, you know, beautiful, gorgeous things about open source is that, you know, uh, is, is the freedom to take what's there and to modify it to your specific purpose. And exactly. even if that specific purpose only addresses, you know, uh, a handful, a dozen people, uh, I, I, you know, a, a hundred people, a thousand people, that's, you know, it's still nothing compared to millions of people using a particular environment. But but because you have the ability to do that, because it is open and there are no penalties other than your time and dedication to it for bringing up this new version of the operating system, um, you are free to build what you need 
if it's not already out there, if it's not what you want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's always been the issue with a Mac or a Windows PC or something like that. I don't like the way that it works. Well, tough bazooki. This is the way we. This is the way we build it. This is the way we distribute it. You're going to be happy with it, or you're going to, you know, like it or lump it. That's what it is. If In the my, open source world, we didn't have to deal with that crap. Right. If you know, if if my listening comprehension is as good as I think it is, what you're saying to all those who are running, you know, uh, maybe less popular versions of operating system is is what, what you're saying is we may be few but we are important and well yeah <laughs> all right no and okay let me let me let me just let me just throw you another one just for fun let's say that you're at a school that is you know a school for gifted children who have special psychic powers okay oh so okay yeah, that that, that's going way out on a limb here that let's say that work. you're let's say that you're working in an environment where you have a very specific way of doing things you you have you have specific teaching needs Okay, you have specific tools and specific teaching needs in this particular school. I'm just making stuff up here. Okay, and that stuff isn't readily available in the open marketplace. Okay, the only way that you have to do it, the only, the only possibility is for you to spin your own version of that. Well, if you're spinning your own version of something that's proprietary, it's going to cost you a fortune. Okay, it's going to cost you a fortune because you're going to have to license it. You're going to have to deal with lawyers. You're going to have to deal with permissions. You have to deal with all sorts of other crap like that. You're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to hire people who are going to have to explain, you know, or have to build layers between these things so that they can talk to each other and so forth. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with open source tools and open standards, and there is no penalty for doing that, and there is a community of people that understand the standards and the source, you know, uh, or for that matter, the hardware. Um, you can build something that is very specific to your environment just because you're a few people, you know, and like you said, we're few, but we're important just because you're a few people or you're a small environment or you're a small company or something like that. You're not barred from access to the tools that you need just because, you know, because you're not big enough, because you're not worth, you know, you're, you're not worth the money and the time for a large company like, you know, like an Apple or a Microsoft to create something for you. Right. No, it, open source gives you that power. Makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. And uh, yeah, no. And th- thanks for putting it that way, uh, Marcel. We have like maybe three more minutes here. Let's uh, let's talk about what you did in Cooking with Linux episode four, which everyone can find on YouTube, of course. And then what uh, what you just did for episode five. Well, episode four is uh, installing software. I'm taking people through uh, the process of installing software. Uh, what what you have to do. Um, to install software on different Linux distributions. And it's really pretty easy. They all have these, I mean, you can do it from the command line, but they all have these cool graphical tools. Each one is slightly different. But so I, I gave people a sample of what it looked like under Fedora, what it looks like under Ubuntu, what it looked like under, uh, you know, a KDE distribution. So just, just to get a feel for how you can search for things. And literally there are, again, here we go with free, thousands and thousands of free applications, sometimes free, you know, free as in speech, free as in beer but you can download it and use it on your system. So that's what episode four was. And in episode five, um, I, I revisited something that I tried years ago. Um, um, now, now what you can do, if you've got a, a, a Minecraft on a personal, on a tablet, like Minecraft PE on a tablet, mm-hmm. sure you can play with friends, uh, but as soon as the person who's running it logs off, it's all over. Okay, it's a bit of a problem. So you could, with something that I did something on years ago, write, um, run your own Minecraft personal edition server. And what I've done is I've, I've brought it into 2016. Uh, there is a <coughs> Minecraft PE server called Nukit, or uh, I call it Nukit. Uh, some people call it Nukit. I call it Nukit and, uh, because they call it a nuclear-powered uh, Minecraft PE server. And um, it lets you run your own server. It's a private environment. It's a environment. Family, your friend, you know, and their friends at school, and um, cooking with Linux five shows you how to do that. Shows you how to set it up and ninety for, uh, seconds. Family and you know, nice safe environment for your kids to play. And the beauty is, when your kid shuts down their tablet because they're not playing anymore, their friends can continue to play, so they can continue to log on and build anytime they want. Got their own private environment in which to work. Very very cool. And of course, uh, it, it's starting to sound like cooking with Linux is starting is uh, is going to be kind of uh, you know. <laughs> An episode for every topic, and it's going to be a great place to start if you want to get into Linux. Check out Cooking with Linux. Uh, 60 is that kind of seconds. It's going to be the one-stop shop for the getting into Linux. 
I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, I'm hoping it's going to be something big. Cooking with Linux on YouTube or cookingwithlinux.com. Perfect. All right. Yeah. And of course, check those out in the show notes. And those will be posted at computeramerica.com. Marcel, as, yeah, you know, the one hour format moves by a lot. That's furious. I know, but there's a lot of great information. Thank you so much for being on. And we look forward to having you on next month as well as we talk about a whole lot more everything Linux. And of course, everyone, Tune in tomorrow as well as uh, we have a couple guests lined up for tomorrow as well as next month because yeah, we're going to try to bring you Linux every single month. Because so everyone, have a great day. And Marcel, say bye. Bye-bye. Ten seconds.